Night, good evening. This is uh, Tuesday, April 13th, and this is our session 25. In our 11th plenary lecture, we're going to welcome Nick Silverman uh, tonight to give a talk on Montana climate futures, Two Roads Diverged. I'm going to pause the recording until we're ready to get started. Okay, I think I'll go ahead and, and get us underway here. Um, this is our final plenary lecture of here, and we've saved one of the best for last here. We're, we're going to welcome uh, to class Nick Silverman here to talk about Montana climate futures. And uh, Emily Cook is um, going to introduce him. I think Emily is, um, if you want to unmute yourself, Emily, and uh, turn your video on there, um, we'll get you underway here. Hi, so tonight our speaker is Nick Silverman. Um, <clears throat> Nick Silverman has experience working in all aspects of the hydraulic cycle and enjoys making connections between water resources at the river, watershed, and regional scales. His career began as an engineer designing stream and wetland restor restoration projects around the Pacific Northwest. During that time, Nick brought designs from the NL from the analysis phase all the way through to construction and monitoring. <clears throat> and then I'm sorry, is Jack in class? Yeah, I don't, Jack is not here. So I think we'll, have, we'll just go ahead with, uh, with that, Emily. That's a, a good introduction. And uh, Nick, I'll, I'll turn it over to you at this point here. If you want to use the share screen feature. Um, yeah, here we go. All right. How's that? Everybody see that? Yes. Okay. Uh, I'll finish the introduction because um, the <laughs> latter half of it is the most most relevant to to this uh, this talk. So it is true. I I kind of started off um, working as a civil engineer, really focused on river and uh, wetland restoration in the Pacific Northwest. But um, I got really interested and um, what really causes our water problems. And so I started chasing water to bigger and bigger scales and eventually ended up studying climate and uh, hydroclimatology at the University of Montana. And when I finished my PhD in the geosciences department, I went on and worked in the state uh, climate office, which is uh, at the University of Montana. And during that time, we were working on the Montana Climate Assessment, which I think is um, was part of the assigned reading. So hopefully you all are familiar with that. That came out in 2017. And you'll, if you did go through that, you might see some figures that are familiar um, in this talk. Uh, but anyways, that kind of got me uh, really focused on the climate stuff. And now I, I tend to work around three different areas, climate, water, and agriculture. Um, and I do a number of different things within those, those three different disciplines. So, um, so that's me. I am very grateful to be here to chat with you all today. So thank you to Professor Spencer for inviting me. I'm jealous of uh, this course. It looks like it's been a fantastic one. I wish I could have taken it. Um, all the other lectures sound really interesting. And I, I hope I can uh, 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 fill the, uh, the shoes of, of, of the people that, that came before me here with, with this talk on climate and, and climate future. So I'll go ahead and get started here. Um, I'm gonna, I don't know if, if some of you have heard me talk before, I give these talks around the state. Uh, I've tried to do some stuff different in this talk, but there'll be some, uh, some stuff that may be familiar to you. The first is I always have to start with kind of an introduction to climate change, just to make sure that we're all speaking the same language here. So uh, we have to uh, define first, come to a, a common definition of, of what is climate. And so the the, the general consensus is that climate is the average weather patterns for a region over many years. <clears throat> and the World Meteorological Organization defines about 50 essential climate variables. So 
So right away, you can see what we're talking about is we're talking about weather, but we're talking about averages of weather over time and over space. So you have to have large areas for it to be climate, and you have to have long periods of time. Usually that's about 30 years at least. And there's a lot of different variables that make up our climate system. So you can see here's, um, here's a few of them. There's 50 of them. But the ones that we tend to focus on are temperature and precipitation. And that's what most of this talk is going to focus on. That's what the climate assessment focused on. But it's important to know that there's many different variables that make up our, our climate and describe our, our climate system. Okay, so that's just climate in general, but what do we mean when we talk about climate change? So if climate is average weather patterns over a large area, then climate change has to be um, over a large area and a long period of time. Climate change is how climate is changing over a large area and over a long period of time. So what I mean by that is imagine some variable, um, some measure of climate like temperature and that goes up and down uh, every year. No year is, is the same. And then maybe there's some underlying oscillation that you know every five to ten years temperatures go up and they go back down and they go up and they go back down. We still don't really consider this climate change until we average that over at least 30 years. And we say okay so over a 30 year period through all that noise, how has temperature changed? And then of course, the other thing we look at is the variability around that long-term average. And so, so are we getting hotter years and colder years or wetter years and drier years that increases our variability around the average? And so those are kind of um, two things that we really look at with, with climate change. What causes climate change? Well, this is the starts with the greenhouse effect. Greenhouse effect is overall a good thing. This is the ability of Earth's atmosphere to trap heat from the sun. So Earth is about 60 degrees Fahrenheit without any atmosphere, without the greenhouse gas effect. Um, it would be uh, zero degrees Fahrenheit and nearly inhabitable. So overall, the greenhouse effect it's a good thing. Trap seat makes things nice and comfortable for us to live on Earth. The problem is, is these, this, these greenhouse gases are increasing. And we know that because we're measuring them in the atmosphere. This is the very famous Keeling curve, which was started by Dr. Keeling down in Hawaii at the Mauna Loa Observatory back uh, in the uh, late 1950s. And this shows carbon dioxide in the atmosphere increasing um, all the way up until April 11th, 2021. So you can see uh, there has been a steady increase over this time period, carbon dioxide being a greenhouse gas, being um, a heat trapping mechanism in our atmosphere, we can uh, uh, go ahead and make the connection that with more greenhouse gas, we get warmer temperatures. Of course, carbon dioxide isn't the only greenhouse gas. There's lots of different greenhouse gases, methane uh, being one, nitrous oxide uh, being another, and fluorinated gases. These are the gases that come from manufacturing of uh, electronics and aluminum and, and these sorts of things. So these make up different greenhouse gases, and each of them trap different amounts of heat. So carbon dioxide is actually the least effective at trapping heat of all the greenhouse gases, but we have the most of it. So it certainly is a very, very significant greenhouse gas. Uh, methane, which comes from agriculture largely, as well as nitrous oxide from our fertilizers, these actually trap more heat than carbon dioxide, but there's less of them. And then fluorinated gases trap the most amount of heat. So Greenhouse gases overall trap heat um, in the atmosphere, and as they increase, they trap more and more heat. So I liken this to imagine it's you know cool day. You put on your favorite sweater. Maybe it looks like this. Maybe it doesn't. And you go outside, and you're comfortable. But you know, if I told you, okay, put on another sweater, 
and another sweater, put on a jacket, a few more jackets. Eventually, it doesn't matter how cold it is outside, it's going to get really uncomfortable. And that's essentially what we're doing when we're increasing greenhouse gases. Okay, so that's my climate change 101 uh, consolidated into nine slides. So we're going to move on. Everybody's now climate change experts. And we're going to start talking about climate change here in Montana and some of the things that we can expect. But I'm going to get a little philosophical here first, because I want to lay the foundation of really what we're up against. Okay, And I want to start with uh, philosopher uh, Jean-Jacques Rousseau from uh, the 1700s. I, I, I actually, so I'm not a philosophy person. I actually haven't read this work, Discourse on the Origin of, of Inequality, but I've read the cliff notes. And, um, and I think there's, I, th I think he was kind of onto something. And I think it's important when we try to understand um, the, uh, the, the psychology behind climate change. And so in, in this work, Discourse on the Origin of Inequality, really what uh, Jean-Jacques Rousseau was trying to do is he was trying to differentiate between humans and animals. And he essentially came down to the idea that humans, that what, what differentiate, differentiates us from animals is we have a liberty of action or a freedom to do what we want beyond just our instinct. We're not just driven by some software. We, can, we have this freedom. And this desire, or this freedom, leads to a desire of excess, of what we need to survive, right? In the animal kingdom, animals tend to do exactly what they need to survive. Humans tend to seek more, OK? So this desire for excess, it, le it has led to some really wonderful things. For one, it's led to culture. If we didn't have this, um, this, this desire for more, we wouldn't have this constantly changing, interesting culture. History wouldn't really exist. If you think of you know, the culture of, of an animal species or the history of an animal species, it doesn't really change much. Um, whereas, uh, whereas we evolve. We evolve both from a Darwinian sense, but we also evolve um, in terms of you know, year to year, decade to decade, as to how we innovate and how we change and what we learn. And this is all really wonderful, great things. It, it's what makes us human. But of course, this desire for excess also leads to some problems, right? We see excess evil, we see excess selfishness, we see excess sorrow, and we see excess consumption. And so the reason I bring this up is because climate change is the way I see it is sort of at the heart of what it is to be a human being. It's our internal struggle here between this desire for excess, this liberty of action, as Rousseau says. So the question is really where will our desire for excess overcome our ability to evolve and adapt and innovate? And I think this is a really interesting question. I don't know the answer, but I think it really gets at the heart is both being a human has created this problem, and being a human is what's going to get us out of this problem. OK, so that's enough philosophy for now. We're going to go back into sort of the science of, of, of climate and climate change, and we're going to start uh, prognosticating the future here. So OK, there's a few rules, though, for telling the future with science. You know, We're not going to use telepathy or any psychic powers. We're going to use science here. The first one is <clears throat> observe the past carefully. And this is probably true of a psychic too, if you think about it, is you, you want to observe what's around you, what you know. If you're going to try and guess what the future is, you need to know what happened in the past. What's, what's the history of what's going on? So let's, let's take a look at that. So first off, Montana, if we're going to get at Montana's climate future, we have to understand the climate future of the globe. So there is a spatial component here. We're not isolated from what happens globally in, 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 uh, in this challenge here. So here's a, a, a very simple color graph of temperature from 1850 all the way to 2019. It's a really simple point here. 
it's getting warmer, right? These are global temperatures over averaged over this time, and it's getting warmer quickly. And most of it has happened in the last 30 or 40 years. Just by looking at it, you can see that globally, we have not had an average temperature for like the last 30 years or so. All of our temperatures, probably over most of your lifetimes, have been above the global average temperature. So this is what that looks like, that same graph, if we were to look at it um, spatially over the globe. So starting in 1900, going through time, you can see sort of how these different countries and states have, uh, you know, their temperatures have changed. And you can see for the most part, they've stayed pretty similar until you get to about 1950. And then all of a sudden things start warming up. By 1980, you start to see a lot of red, not much blue. And by 2019, you see almost the whole globe is red, right? Now, what's really interesting about this, and of course, this isn't, this, this just happens to be interesting because we live in Montana, but look at Montana and, uh, and the high plains there. It's blue. It's like the only place on the planet in 2019 that was cooler than average. So it, this kind of highlights, you know, it may feel like a cool year here, but let's not be mistaken. Things are happening. You know, this is a global phenomenon here. So, um, so anyways, but of course, we are talking about climate. We are talking about averages. We're not talking about weather. Weather has noise in it. We have cool years. We have hot years, obviously, and that's going to continue into the future. Um, so, but it is, it is kind of interesting to look at our own little patterns right here in terms of 2019. I will say um, 2020, I know we're back in the red and then we're off to a very warm start already in 2021. So I anticipate that being any sort of a trend. So in terms of precipitation, things aren't quite so clear and, um, and this is because precipitation is really what we call a second order effect of climate change. So if you can imagine greenhouse gas is increasing in the atmosphere, it's trapping more heat. So the first order effect of that is gonna be a rise in temperature. Whereas with the rise in temperature, that's gonna cause a change in our hydrologic cycle. So it's gonna increase the ability of the air to hold moisture, but it's also going to increase the drying of moisture on the landscape. It's going to increase the intensity of when it rains. Um, and, and so it's a much more complicated uh, uh, impact and it's harder to see its effects. And this is shown uh, in this, in, in, in this um, analysis here, looking at precipitation trends over the globe. So here you can see green is where uh, precipitation has increased over the last 30 years. Brown is where it's decreased. In general, they tend to say the areas that are getting, that are already wet are projected to get wetter, and the areas that are already dry are projected to get drier. Overall, not with a huge change in precipitation, but there's nuances to that. But you can kind of see it in the spatial patterns here. So this is sort of globally, but what's happened historically here in Montana. So this is that same uh, um, illustration of the color lines representing temperature from 1900 all the way to 2019. And you can see there's a little bit more noise here. It's not quite as clean. This is typical because we're not averaging over such a large area. So we're picking up smaller um, weather patterns. So you're, you're going to see more of a fluctuation here. Um, but you can still see that in the last 20, 30 years, we've had um, our temperature has been increasing. And the majority of those years are warmer than average. And if we look at it in a more conventional way, that, that steady trend shows up um, um, pretty strongly here. And, um, and you can see that even with this up and down noise, we get a, a, an increasing trend that ends up being around two degrees Fahrenheit. Um, and this was 
this hasn't been updated for the last few years, but it's similar um, if we were to add the most current years to this graph as well. So temperature is definitely increasing here in Montana. Precipitation is uh, a little harder to figure out. Um, and it's also, this is averaged over the state. If you break it up into west of the continental divide and east of the continental divide, you can start to see some trends. But the, the reality is, is we still don't really know. Um, we haven't seen a strong change in precipitation, at least averaged over the year and averaged over the state. And, um, and so, uh, well, I'll get to the, what this means for the future in a little bit. But anyways, the, the signal here is not quite as, as, um, as strong. Okay, so that's looking historically at, um, at, at what's happened at the global scale as well as at the local scale. So, um, so if we consider sort of what is that telling us, well, we can get a few things from that information. One, it's really obvious that temperature is increasing. It's increasing at the global scale. It's increasing in Montana. It shows up in a number of different um, different ways. Precipitation is a little more uncertain. And so that's one we'll put a question mark by for now. So moving on to number two here in telling the future. So the next step is to focus on making accurate assumptions about what's going to happen in the future. This is obviously a challenging thing to do. So, uh, but let's talk about kind of the, at least the, the sort of best practices for making some of these assumptions. So here's kind of a cool animation that shows the relationship between carbon dioxide concentration in the atmosphere and global mean temperature. And this is what I was saying. There's just a really strong relationship between these two variables. And you can see this going through time here more carbon dioxide in the atmosphere leading to higher global mean temperatures. It really starts to increase as those uh, constant, uh, as CO2 increases. And while yes, there's some noise around that in terms of environmental modeling and statistics, that is a really strong signal. So what happens if we take that out into the future? This is kind of the business as usual scenario. Well, it gets a little scary, first off, right? So we've got um, carbon dioxide concentration in the atmosphere, almost 800 parts per million by 2100. Um, but if we can, if we have hold on to a little bit more optimism that, hey, we're going to do something about this, we can start to explore what that might look like in terms of global mean temperature. So if we're going to start to reduce our carbon emissions, if we're going to develop some technology that maybe sequesters carbon um, from the atmosphere, if we're going to change our agricultural practices, these are all going to have different impacts and different uh, scenarios for the future. And that's what these kind of lines are. So can we curve this carbon emission temperature trajectory that we're on? That's the question. And so to do that, because we don't know exactly what the future holds, we use these different um, um, pathways or different scenarios for the future that represent um, different greenhouse gas emission scenarios. And these are called representative concentration pathways. And there's four of them. I do think they're working on some new um, ways of sort of handling these assumptions. But for now, at least in the most recent uh, IPCC report or the Inter Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, who sort of runs these big reports, this was, this was sort of the standard way of handling it. And it's what we used in the Montana Climate Assessment. So uh, for now, we'll just keep, keep using these four scenarios. But Essentially, the way to think about these is these are, there's not any detail in these scenarios as to what we're going to do to curb uh, 
carbon emissions, or it, it's it's really a, it's CO two equivalent. So it's it could be methane, it could be nitrous oxide, but they the measure that they use is a CO two equivalency for that. And what these represent are um, are trajectories of these uh, pathways into the future, independent of okay, are we gonna do this because we're gonna invent some new form of energy? Or are we gonna do this because we're gonna pull all of the carbon out of the atmosphere and stick it in the ground? Or are we gonna, you know, how are we gonna get there? We don't know, but we're just gonna assume in these different scenarios that we're gonna, we're gonna get there in different ways, okay? So the RCP 2.6 scenario essentially assumes that we start um, um, curbing our carbon emissions by like, Two or three years ago, and in the for the most part, we know uh, this is not a very realistic, unfortunately, not a very realistic scenario for us anymore. So people tend to drop this RCP 2.6 because we're just nowhere near this trajectory. So then there's these other two scenarios: the RCP 4.5 and the RCP 6.0. These represent more or less a similar future scenario that um, revolves around us figuring things out by about mid-century. And they're slightly different, but for the most part, they're, they get it kind of a, a similar idea. And so we tend to pick one or the other. And in the case of the Montana Climate Assessment, we focused on RCP 4.5, which does tend to be the one that's uh, more readily covered, and uh, dropped RCP 6.0. And then, of course, the red line, this is the 8.5 scenario, this is more or less the business as usual uh, scenario. And that is important to explore and that it, and we did do that in the, uh, in the state climate assessment. So those are, you know, so our assumptions are a little less specific as to what we're gonna do in the future and more focused on the outcomes. So how are carbon emissions going to change? How are, you know, um, irrespective of technological developments. But these are kind of the assumptions that we make. And the idea is that really, rather than make one assumption about how what the future may hold, we explore several. <clears throat> okay, so the third is maybe a little bit of cheating, uh, you know, in terms of guessing the future, but we do rely on big, powerful computers to tell us what they think might happen in, uh, in the next 50 to 100 years. So um, we base the things that go into those computers, actually before I go there, are based on historical relationships and they're based on these assumptions. <clears throat> so this is where climate modeling comes, comes in. So there's really these three main rules to climate modeling. And the first one is that we never use just one model. So a model is essentially a really, really sophisticated guess or estimate. And it's based on physics, it's based on chemistry, it's based on all these really um, uh, important relationships that we know exist. But in the end, there are assumptions in each of these models and, it, and they are all a little bit different. So we never rely on just one we run several different models. This is called an ensemble. And so I'll talk a little bit about that later. And then the second I've already talked about, this is we don't rely on one future scenario. This is where those representative concentration pathways um, come in. So we look at several different scenarios for the future. And then lastly, we look at a few different time periods. So we look at mid-century, um, which is a 30 year time period around 2050. We look at the end of century, which is a 30 year time period towards the end of the year. And then we compare that to the historical, which is a 30 year time period uh, um, in, uh, in the 20th century, last, the last 30 years of the 20th century. So, and in the, so in these climate models, they, uh, have quite a task at hand and that we're talking about modeling 
uh, the entire climate system. So all 50 of those variables that I talked about early on in this talk, they all are uh, go into this go into these models. They include uh, um, ocean um, currents. They include land surface feedbacks. They include snow. They include obviously atmospheric. Um, um, uh, um, physics and uh, incoming solar energy clouds, all these, you know, anything you can think of goes into these models. And of course, um, you, these models are getting better and better as our understanding and our computing get better and better. So as time goes on, these models um, improve and our understanding and the nuances of, of, of climate change and what to expect are um, illuminated more. However, and I think this is really important, even if you go back, and this, this is a model run from 2004, so it's almost 20 years old, but you can go back almost 40 years to when the first models were really developed that were trying to model uh, temperature change due to uh, greenhouse gas. And they have done really exceptionally well. And it's, I have to say, it's one of the most frustrating things. It actually gets me um, at times just pretty irritated to think 40 years ago, we already knew what we were getting into. We already had models that were pretty accurate as far as telling us where we would be right now and where we're gonna be 50 years from now. And we still never did anything. So, you know, fast forward 40 years, Things are following the same path that we thought they would. Um, this is an example from, two, from a model that was developed almost 20 years ago. The red line is observations of global temperature change. The black line is the ensemble mean. So remember, these are lots of models. We average all those models to get the ensemble mean. You can see that red and black line line up pretty well. And certainly they're within the, the ensemble uh, spread or the 95% confidence intervals in that light blue gray color encapsulate um, the observations really well. So even 20 years ago, we were, we were um, getting the answers that we needed to have to be making changes that we needed to make. <clears throat> and I think furthermore, we should have confidence in these models and of course, you know, some of the nuances in them, they change and we can be off a little bit here, off a little bit there. Sometimes it makes things worse. Sometimes it makes things better. But the overall trajectory has really been consistent and these models do a really nice job capturing those. So hopefully I've convinced you to trust the models um, and um, and then, and, and so now I wanna go into what those models tell us about the future for Montana. And these are results from the Montana Climate Assessment that came out in 2017. But for the most part, um, they're pretty, pretty consistent with if we were to run it this year, I, we would get pretty similar results. So this is the projected change in average annual temperature for the state of Montana. You can see these different shapes here. These are climate divisions. So they're sort of a um, amalgamation of counties, of, of political boundaries and watershed boundaries. Um, and we've got seven of them here in the state. So when we look at the change in average annual temperature, this is for the RCP 4.5 scenario. So this is assuming you know, we start to kind of figure things out pretty shortly here. And then this is the, that business as usual. And you can see we're talking about a difference in about a two degree difference between those two scenarios, but not a lot of difference across the state. You know, it's, it's pretty consistent here that we're looking at anywhere from like a you know, four and a half to six degree increase over our historical um, temperatures. So, Remember though, we had, what we were looking at here, this is that ensemble average. So this is taking all the models and then averaging them. But we do have a spread, a 
around those models. And that's what this is getting at. And so what, just to sort of make it a little bit more simple here to understand, just focus on this Northwest. This is the, the uh, Northwest region right here, this, the one that we live in. And you can see this, this line right here, this is the median of the model um, projections. This is the maximum of the model projections, and this is the minimum. And so this sort of shows the spread around those models in terms of um, projecting the uh, um, change in temperature by mid-century. And, and we're looking just at the uh, RCP, at the business as usual scenario right now. But you can see it's fairly similar across the state in all these climate divisions. So the important thing, what I always point out to people is right here, this zero line, this is zero change, okay? So essentially what it's saying is in all of the climate divisions across the whole state, using all of the models, and these are um, independent models from all over the world, developed by the smartest scientists at every climate institution, you know, and, and across the globe, and all of those models, not a single model is suggesting that we'll be anywhere close to zero degrees, to, a zero, to, to zero change, right? Every single model is well above that. So when people say there's disagreement among models, yeah, there is in terms of, you know, what degree change, but I would say this is 100% agreement that things are gonna get warmer here in Montana by mid-century. So there's other things we can look at beyond just a change in temperature. We can look at stuff, okay, well, like what are the number of days above 90 degrees Fahrenheit? So, you know, you can think of this as like those really hot days um, here in Montana and how many of those in a historical year do we have versus how many of those days will we have in the future? And so um, if we look at the, the, uh, uh, the 4.5 scenario, in fact, if we just look at both of them, the spatial patterns are, are really the same here and that the eastern part of the state is projected to get uh, more of those hot days. It already has more of those hot days, but it's projected to get almost a, over a month more per year of days above 90 degrees Fahrenheit. Okay, the western part of the state where we are a little less so, but still about a week difference there. And um, there's reasons for that that maybe well, you know, some of those reasons, I guess, is if you think about the, um, you know, the landscape and the climate of, of, of our state, we kind of have a unique state in that we're split between two um, uh, um, climate, um, well, between two climates. One is sort of this maritime, this Pacific maritime, which really comes from the Pacific Ocean, and we get kind of the leftover effects of like the Seattle and Pacific Northwest rain systems that come in. By the time they hit the Rockies, it squeezes the rest of the water out of those systems. And that water acts as a cooling mechanism. And so that's why you see less of these hot days and less of a change um, in the future for those. Whereas the eastern part of the state is more of this continental polar uh, air mass or climate where it's much drier, it gets less rain. And, um, and so uh, and most of that water is already squeezed out by the time it get, by the time those systems come through, and so that heat doesn't get cooled by water. It it um, and that's uh, um, in science terms, it's called latent heat. So there's there's not as much latent heat in the eastern part of the state, which means that when the when the when the sun hits it, and when this when the heat traps it, it's gonna it's it's gonna heat up even that much more. <clears throat> so then. Um, if we look at kind of the opposite, which is this is the change in the number of freeze free days. So these are those days um, where it doesn't freeze. So every all the temperatures stay below freeze or um, sorry, above freezing. Um, you can see that in the western part of the state, we're going to see more of a change. So this is like kind of if you're a skier or a snowboarder or somebody who likes snow, you know, this is one you want to pay attention to. So we're looking at over a month, month and a half difference of days that used to be below freezing. No, I'm saying that wrong. That used to be above 
sorry, that used to be below freezing and will now be above freezing. That's the, that's the way to think about it. And so the Western part of the state really stands, really stands out here. Um, and um, yeah, and, and if you look at the difference between the business as usual um, scenario and then our, our, our um, 4.5 scenario, you can see um, it's, it's fairly significant. It's about a two week difference. <clears throat> So this is looking at the averages over the whole year, but we also know we also need to take a look at how changes month to month might look in the future, sort of seasonal changes. And so this is one way to take to, to visualize that. So here, again, let's focus on the Northwest Climate Division. That's the one we're in. So just focus on this top line here, and this is that the number, or sorry, this is the change and the average monthly temperature uh, for each month for the Northwest Climate Division. And so you can see, again, it's all orange um, and it's all warming, but, you, um, but the, the most warming is projected to occur in, in the summer months. And so you can imagine what that might mean for agriculture during our growing season, what it might mean for wildfire in the Northwest, those sorts of things. <clears throat> All right, so that's temperature. Let's talk a little bit about precipitation. So this is the change in average annual precipitation uh, percentage, the percent change for the state of Montana for the two different scenarios here. You'll see that it's all green, all scenarios, all climate divisions. That's overall a, a good thing. That means we are projected um, annually to have more rain in the future. <clears throat> and if we look at the change in the number of days where we get above one inch of rain, so you can think of this as kind of like those really high intensity rain events, you can see it's also all green. So increases in those, not by a lot, but, um, but increases across the whole state in terms of those really intense rain events. And then if we look at the change in the number of consecutive dry days, so this is um, how many days in a row do you, are, are, um, uh, are you below a certain threshold in precipitation? And then what's the difference between historical and future? So it's kind of like a drought indicator. Um, but what's really interesting here is yes, it's kind of green, but you see a lot of white, which means no change. Um, and for the most part, when you look at, at what we're really talking about, even in the darkest green areas, it's less than a, it's really projecting less than a day difference, which is not very significant. But here's where that en ensemble approach really comes in to play, because here, if we look at how the, the spread around those numbers, and remember here, Let's, we'll focus on the Northwest, you've got your, your median value right here in the middle. And this is saying, okay, yeah, it's like, you know, a little bit of a positive change in consecutive dry days. So getting a little bit drier. But when, when you talk about, if you look across the whole ensemble, you've got several that are saying it's going to increase by a good bit more. And you got several that are saying it's going to decrease by a good bit more. And when you look across all of them, you can see you have a good bit of disagreement among the models, which means it's a different interpretation of this, of this figure. And the way I would interpret it is we really don't know which direction this is going to go in. And that's important as well to understand our uncertainties around these projections. So lastly, and I think this is uh, one of the more important figures in terms of our projections for the state is, um, is when we break down these changes in precipitation over the months. And for the first time, you start to see some shades of brown. And this is where we're expected to get less precipitation than we have in the past. So in the early winter, spring, expected to get more, in fact, a good bit more fall slightly a bit, you know, a, a little bit more. Summer, however, we're expected to get less. So now add up the fact that we're expected to see the biggest changes in temperature, in temperature 
during the same months that we're expected to see a negative change, a shift to less precipitation in the summer, it adds up to probably some stuff that we should be concerned about here in Montana. <clears throat> All right, so there's the, the, the climate models um, and, and, um, and what they sort of say for the future of Montana. But what does that really mean for us here in Missoula, for us in Montana? You know, if I tell you it's gonna get hotter by, um, you know, five degrees, what does that really mean? It's really hard to convey that. And so one thing that we've been trying to do here in Missoula is use this scenario approach, which is one that they use in uh, social sciences. And so we've taken these climate models and this science behind it, and we've tried to convey it in these different scenarios because we recognize there's some uncertainty in our projections. And so, um, and so we've broken that into three different scenarios to wrap our brains around what that really means for us here in Montana. So this first scenario, and I'm going to go through these pretty quickly here. Um, but if you, you know, if you, if you have questions, let me know. Um, is the really hot and dry scenario. So this is, you know, if you consider um, the warmest temperature projections with the driest um, precipitation projections. And I don't know if, if those of you were around in, in uh, 2017 when we had the really big wildfire year and the really big drought year in the eastern part of the state, but that was really what aligned. And it's kind of frightening actually how similar that year was to um, our projections for mid-century average conditions. So you can think of sort of that year as maybe a, an approximation of, of what this particular scenario might look like. So we're talking about very hot conditions, um, temperatures similar to Denver, so which is 500 miles south of here, <clears throat> two to three weeks of additional temperatures above 90 degrees Fahrenheit, uh, average annual precipitation about the same, but summer's 30% drier. 50% <clears throat> increase in annual land area burned, smoke lasting into September, a decline in a, a significant decline in snowpack, peak stream flows two to three weeks earlier, lower August stream flows, and higher stream temperatures, um, and then a longer growing season, but of course less water during that growing season. So the next scenario to consider, we call this the here comes the rain again scenario. And this is where it's really uh, focused a bit more on the, um, on, on the wetter side of our projection. So this is, we, we say to think back to spring of 2018, where things um, got pretty exciting here in Missoula. We had some big floods on the Clark Fork, um, but we had lots of rain. Um, still warm, uh, but not quite as warm as the other scenario about one week of additional daily temperatures rather than you know three weeks, 15% increase in average annual precipitation, summer precip that um, doesn't change. So this is on the more positive side of things in terms of summer precipitation, but more intense rainfall events, which leads to um, more flooding also from rain on snow events because we do ex obviously in all of these scenarios expect warmer temperatures, more frequent flooding, Spring rains um, may promote rapid green up, um, followed by hotter, browner, prolonged summers. Growing season increases by two to three weeks. But in this case, we actually have um, some water to take advantage of that growing season. So maybe we also get an expansion in the types of crops we can grow. Uh, increase in droughts and wildfire, but not as much as the first scenario. And then this third scenario, this is the feast or famine. And this is the one I sort of think maybe the most realistic. It's also the one that I think is the hardest to figure out. But this is kind of that really high variability where you get every year, you don't know which one of the scenarios you're going to get. So it's a little bit hotter than the previous one. It's kind of somewhere in the middle on average on a lot of these. Um, but you really get high variability year to year. Um, and this becomes really hard, as you can imagine, for farmers to guess what to do in terms of when to plant. Um, so there's really no more average years. Um, and we have increased variability in fire season length. Um, and of course, the, the timing of the wildfire season, 
We get wet year flooding that can be exacerbated by dry year fires. So it's sort of this interaction between wet and dry um, and the unpredictability um, obviously could have impacts on tourism and wildlife. Who wants to come to Montana if you don't know if it's going to be on fire or flooding or, you know, whatever. Okay, so that's kind of how we break down these climate predictions into something that's maybe a little bit more um, tangible for, um, for us on the ground. But what does this really all mean for Montana? So far, we've really talked about something called what that we call exposure, which is, you know, what are we going to be exposed to? More rain, higher temperatures, but there's a lot more that comes into play in terms of guessing what our, our future might mean here. You know, how do we adapt? What is our resiliency? How about how vulnerable are we? And how sensitive are we to these changes? <clears throat> so this is where this idea of mitigation versus adaptation really comes into play. So mitigation, you can think this is how do we mitigate climate change through reducing emissions. Adaptation is regardless of what happens with emissions, how do we adapt on the ground? And of course, the sweet spot is, you know, can we find stuff that does both? So I really always like to, you know, I try and find solutions that are somewhere here in the middle. Um, you know, I think agriculture offers a lot of these, um, storing uh, carbon in the soil, growing food um, uh, uh, more resiliently. I think obviously um, our new energy systems can be similar. We can adapt through um, um, and mitigate at the same time. So, uh, so anyway, so in terms of like trying to figure out how these how this exposure is going to impact us on the ground, we have to also consider how we're going to adapt um, to these to these changes. And so these are some of the work that I've been involved with here in the state that are trying to get more at what do we do with this climate change stuff. And the first one is, you know, asking the question of where, where are we most vulnerable? And so this is um, an analysis we did in the climate change and human health report that came out um, last year. And it really, it, and it's focused on vulnerability to heat across the state. Vulnerability in the climate change world is um, defined as some function of exposure. So like I said, so in this case, temperature or land surface temperature. Sensitivity, which um, you can think of um, in this case, sensitivity might be like a health condition, like a cardiovascular condition or something like that. And then adaptive capacity. A lot of times this is like socioeconomic. So, you know, do you have enough money to buy an air conditioning? That would be, an ad that would be your ad uh, adaptive capacity. And so we can, we can add these all up and we can figure out, you know, where are we most vulnerable? And so you can see some combination of, of exposure sensitivity and an adapt, um, adaptive capacity leads to, um, to sort of some variability and vulnerability across the state. And then the other thing is, um, if we understand these three different um, components of vulnerability, then we can also understand, you know, why are we vulnerable? Are we vulnerable because we're lacking adaptive capacity? Are we vulnerable because of sensitivity? Or are we vulnerable because it's just really, really hot? And so when we can identify why we're vulnerable, then it helps to get us um, to some solutions to decrease that vulnerability. <clears throat> and that project in the, C in the uh, Climate Change and Human Health Report was really driven by a project we did earlier here at um, University of Montana that um, um, turned into a master's project by Julie Tompkins and was part of the Thriving Earth Exchange um, program. Um, and where, where Julie did something really similar for just the city of Missoula. And so you can see this is the results of, of, of something very similar at a much higher resolution. And it doesn't really show up here, but if you average this um, vulnerability to heat across the different neighborhoods in Missoula, one of the really interesting um, findings was that land surface temperature tends to be hotter in our neighborhoods that tend to be more vulnerable. So, or, or that tend to be either higher sensitivity or lower adaptive capacity. So they tend to really 
exacerbate each other. Uh, and, and, you, and, and you can think of lots of reasons as to why, and maybe we can discuss those later. But essentially, you know, the neighborhoods where maybe we have less adaptive capacity, uh, lower income neighborhoods tend to have hotter land surface temperatures. So it's a recipe for high vulnerability. Uh, also, as part of the Climate Ready Missoula project, we um, looked into how vulnerable our water resources are here in Missoula. So this was kind of a little simple analysis where we looked at groundwater wells around, uh, around the city. And we looked at how sensitive those groundwater wells were to um, changes in summer um, uh, drought or long-term drought. And the reason is, is because the, the climate projections suggests that we can expect hotter, drier summers for the most part. And so what we wanted to know is how much does that matter in terms of our water resources? And what you can see, and this gets into some statistics and I won't bore you with all that, but these lower values essentially are saying that drought, or um, sorry, our, our groundwater resource is less um, impacted by these uh, summer conditions than it is like a much longer term drought. So, and we don't have a lot of evidence to suggest, although we could, um, uh, although we may, but we don't have a lot of evidence to suggest that we're gonna start getting long multi-year droughts and increase in those. And so this sort of breaks it up. It says, okay, these changes in summer conditions, how much will those affect our water resources? These lower values mean not as much as sort of a longer term drought. So, um, so in conclusion, kind of our, we feel like our groundwater resources are somewhat resilient to the mid-century and, and end of century projections, um, given that we don't have these really, really long-term droughts. <clears throat> we can also look at, you know, how does Missoula or Montana's climate future compare to other parts of the country? And so this is an analysis we did also for Climate Ready Missoula, where um, we looked at a couple different studies that have been done on the county scale and broke down um, different impacts um, from climate change on different sectors. So agriculture, um, energy, labor, um, you know, uh, property, um, crime, all these sorts of things. The one thing they didn't have is they didn't have smoke. And we know here in Montana that that's a big part of our climate change future. So there was another study that focused just on sort of future um, um, damage from smoke or um, um, from smoke risk. And so we sort of combined these and we, and, and, and we looked at how does Missoula compare to other areas of the country. And specifically, we were trying to answer the question, can we expect more people to move, move to Missoula because of climate change or less people? Or, or do we expect people to move away from Missoula because of climate change? So getting at this sort of climate migration um, problem, or at least a uh, conundrum. So the answer was we looked at, um, these are the top 10, what I call the most connected counties to Missoula. So these are the counties where people either move to or come from the most here in Missoula. And all the counties that are um, uh, in dark purple here, these are all areas where um, their climate impacts are worse than ours. So this is the one county, Pierce County, where um, our climate impacts are projected to be worse, worse than. But for the most part, we're expected to be better off than at least the areas that we're most connected to. So one conclusion from that is we can probably expect people to come here rather than people to leave here. <clears throat> okay, so those are some of the projects that are trying to get at um, what's really you know, going on, um, how, how climate change is going to impact us in the future, I guess. Um, but there's lots going on in Montana right now. Um, of course, there's the 2020 um, Climate Solutions Plan that hopefully you guys are aware of and took a look at. Of course, I don't, we're waiting to see if Gianforte does anything with this, but it does exist. We can't, can't take that away. Um, and it was a lot of good work in there. And very bipartisan, by the way, a really um, diverse group of folks got together 
to work on that um, from all different areas of, of, um, of Montana, both geographically and economically. Uh, then, of course, there's the Climate Ready Missoula Plan. This is very much um, actually in the works and very much um, happening. So uh, the county just hired a full-time position to lead this effort in terms of the implementation of, of the Climate Ready Plan. And then the city is also looking to hire um, somebody to, uh, to, to help with the implementation. So there's actually resources going into this right now to make this happen. And then, of course, Missoula has done a lot of great things leading Montana um, with a zero by, 50, zero by 2050 in terms of um, waste. So getting our, our waste to zero by 2050 is a huge goal, um, an ambitious goal. And then of course we have our 100% clean electricity by 2030 goal. That actually spurred Helena to do the same thing. So we led the charge there. Helena now also has 100% clean electricity by 2030 plan. Um, then we got lots of um, climate adaptation plans and strategic plans. The tribes have sort of led the way there. CSKT has a fantastic one. Blackfeet have, uh, have one. Um, uh, obviously, we have one. Um, Bozeman just came out with one. Whitefish has one. And then uh, the Bitterroot, actually. I've been helping the Bitterroot, which is a very small group with very little resources and a very conservative part of the state they have actually started their adaptation plan and they have a group down there um, called the Bitterroot Climate Action Group that is working on this stuff. So it's, it is happening and it's happening in areas of the state that you wouldn't expect it to happen in. And then the last thing I want to highlight is a group that's not Montana um, focused, but, um, but if, if people are feeling like they want to get involved in something, um, a friend of mine started a group called Climate Change Makers. And she's, it's actually largely um, based out of California. She's in California. And it was around the uh, recent election where people were feeling like they wanted to do something. They were really realizing climate change is a global issue. It's certainly a national issue. They were feeling sort of hamstrung being really local in California. So they formed this group to really get, get after it in terms of taking action. And most of it is... Um, Kind of political action. It's trying to get leaders um, um, who could make change around climate change in office and then trying to hold their feet to the fire, which is now where this group has transitioned. So they literally, they start their ask at doing one hour a week of action. And maybe it's making phone calls. Maybe it's, you know, I don't know, doing some sort of education or outreach. Um, but it's really now focused on holding people who made promises and got elected making sure that they follow through with those promises. And it's a really great group. So I wanted to let you all know about that. And it, they have a group that's focused on Montana, um, or at least the Mountain West. OK, so I was asked <laughs> to offer, what's the solution to climate change? Um, obviously, this is a really big question. But the answer is actually like really simple. And um, it's always all of the above. It really is. So when somebody asks, you know, does it matter if I do this? Or is it, you know, how much, how much personal responsibility do I have? Or is this really a systemic thing? Do, I, do we need to focus on, on um, the systems and the institutions and making change with corporations? Yes, the answer is yes, all of the above. We have to do it. Is it about um, sequestering carbon? Or is it about changing our um, energy to renewable? Yes, the answer is yes, all of the above. You know, is it about changing our agricultural system or changing transportation, we have to do it all. So all of the above. Um, if we do all of the above, I think we have a chance. <clears throat> so probably the biggest thing, and this is um, where I'll leave you all, well, um, yeah, more or less, um, is what I ask when I talk to students is I say, you know, everybody here is building towards a career. Um, you know, that's, that's a large part why you go to school. It may not be the only one, but you know, ultimately I think we're all hoping to get a job when we graduate. And I would say that, or my ask is that everybody consider you know, how they can make a difference in their career. And I'm not saying choose a career to solve climate change. You, know, you need to follow your passions um, and make sure you do that. But I think within every career path, there's an opportunity to make a difference here. And so I was listening just this weekend. This is a great podcast, How to Save a Planet by um, Gimlet Media. And so if people are listening to it, you should. It gives lots of good ideas. But I was listening to it just this weekend. 
and they had this little activity and I thought it was perfect. So they said, okay, you know, ask yourself, you know, what brings you joy in life? Ask yourself, what are you good at? And then what are the things specifically here in climate change that need doing? And this little area right here in the middle, this is that area where you should focus on, you know? And so, um, and, and, and so, you know, I challenge you to actually sit down and, and do this activity and look at this overlap between these three things and find where you might be able to make a difference here. And maybe it's, you know, it, it, it doesn't have to be, you know, solving climate change, but it can be making, you know, very small differences, you know, um, because everything is sort of connected to this problem. <clears throat> so, you know, the title of my talk is Montana Climate Futures, um, Two Roads Diverged. And, you know, where does this come from? Well, it really comes from this poem by Robert Frost that probably most of you are aware of. Um, I'll just read the last stanza. I shall be telling this with a sigh. Somewhere ages and ages hence, two roads diverged in a wood, and I, I took the one less traveled by, and that has made all the difference. So in this, I sort of think of us having these two paths. We have this business as usual path, and this is the one that's been very well traveled. We've been traveling on it for a really long time. But it's time to take this new path, this one that's less traveled. And, um, and the time is really now, and, you know, I challenge all of you to help, you know, make that change. And so, you know, with that, I'll open it up to questions and, um, you know, hopefully, uh, you know, we can um, help come up with solutions together. together. So thank you very much for, uh, for listening. So Nick, I'm turning on the microphones here and uh, we've got about 10 minutes here and then Nick is also able to join us for the first part of class on Thursday. So we'll have more opportunity uh, to follow up here. I'm gonna offer the um, first question to Emily and Jack. Uh, they're the introducers there if you, and they're both on Zoom. So if you guys want to um, just uh, make yourself visible and, uh, and uh, offer up uh, the first questions to get us started in our discussion. That'll be great. Emily, you want to get us underway? Yes. Um, let me go to my question. So my question is the concept of Pleistocene rewilding has been proposed as a partial mitigator to climate change um, because large animals in colder regions might stamp down the grass and create a tundra or maybe, or maybe even a permafreeze. Um, and I was wondering how well do you think this would actually work in Montana and what are your thoughts on actually following through or doing it? Oh my gosh, that's a really hard question. Um, Pleistocene rewilding. I'm not from, can you tell me more about that? Yeah, I'm sorry. Um, that was in a earlier talk um, that they were talking about like bringing back animals from the Pleistocene era, such as like woolly mammoths and larger herbivores like that, and maybe even like buffalo. Um, and so that was, you know, maybe a mitigator for climate change in rural, colder places like Montana. And I just wanted to grab your thoughts on that. Yeah, it's interesting. I haven't heard of it, um, but what it what I what I am really excited about is um, the regenerative agriculture movement, which involves a lot around um, changing our grazing practices and um, looking at ways to um, build up soil, uh, build up soil carbon. And um, so, so, and when you build up that organic material by um, all sorts of different things, rotation crops, no-till practices, grazing practices. What you get is you get um, more organic material in the soil, which, um, which obviously holds carbon in there. So it's a mitigating impact. But then with more organic material, you also hold more water, which is an adaptation for drought. And so you're getting at that really sweet spot that, that I was sort of describing. That's both a mitigation and an adaptation strategy. And I personally just love those. Um, I think, you know, so I think st something like that is we're absolutely 
very well suited here in Montana for regenerative agriculture. There's a lot of groups that are already doing it. There was a soil health bill that was in the legislative session that very, very unfortunately got um, uh, turned down, but all it was asking was to make soil health a priority here in Montana. Um, so I think there's opportunities um, there. Bringing woolly mammoths back? I don't know, that sounds cool. I don't, I don't know anything about it. <laughs> Nick, I, just one comment on that, and then I'll turn to Jack for a question. But I remember um, back when I used to teach in the Midwest, I went out to an, an organic farm in the middle of Nebraska. Somebody would switch many years ago. And people asked him what his most important crop was that he grew there. And he said, healthy soil. He said, if I just make the soil healthy, everything else takes care of itself. And then when you talk about regenerative agriculture, you know, storing carbon in healthy soil, crops that are adapted to things like that. I think that's a really hopeful sign. And we of course have the peas farm here where they're practicing a lot of those kinds of techniques and stuff, but it's happening in a lot of places too, which is encouraging. Yeah, it's one of the things I'm most excited about, to be honest. Great. I think Jack has got a question now too. Yeah, can you hear me all right? Yeah. Awesome. Um, so my question is, just with you explaining about like different RCP levels, how the state is measuring different possibilities for how the future will look for Montana, whether it's like affecting different regions of the state or like the tourism industry or wildlife, how would you think that other states could kind of follow suit and get accurate predictions for their, their different communities? Yeah, so, okay, so the, the RCP, those scenarios are global. So they're not specific. So essentially we take big, we make big assumptions about how the globe is gonna, you know, how the, how the whole planet is gonna respond in terms of carbon emissions. And then we look at how those changes might impact temperature and precipitation at the state level. So, um, so the RCP scenarios are very much a, a, a global thing. So any other state would use those same scenarios and those exist. Um, so it's, you know, un unfortunately our carbon emissions in Montana don't directly impact our climate in Montana. You know, our carbon mon uh, emissions in Montana impact the global climate because it's so complicated. So we, we can't, there's not really a boundary around Montana. Um, but in terms of other states, you know, Montana is probably somewhere in the middle of the pack. There are some states that don't have a climate assessment. There's some states that did a climate assessment, you know, 10 years before we did. Um, so, uh, you know, in some ways, I think we can act as leaders and in some ways we can, we still need to be following some states that have been even more progressive um, in terms of climate and climate uh, analysis. Do you mind if I ask a follow-up really quick? Of course. Awesome. So um, do you think that in your personal opinion, the kind of three general outcomes that could happen about the um, getting it really hot with less precip precipitation, really wet, or the um, the feast or the um, some that one. <laughs> yeah, yeah, the feast, do you think? Feast, yeah, do you think that the other states across the U.S. are going to kind of follow that same trend of these three po possibilities? Um. Yeah. So those those are more specific to Montana um, in terms of those three scenarios. They were not generic. They were, you know, we kind of looked at, at at those climate projections that I showed, and then we said, okay, let's look at those, and then let's um, come up with some realistic scenarios that describe these possible, um, the possible future impacts. Um, that being said, I think it's probably representative of a lot of states, especially in the Mountain West. You know, you can imagine, though, of course, if you go too far away from Montana, different states have very different concerns. I mean, you go to Florida and they're worried about sea level rise. It's not really something that's in our any of our scenarios, right? Um, or if you go to um, uh, you know the, the Southwest, they're going to be really focused on on heat and drought. It, it's not quite as big of a deal here, you know. I always say, I, I personally think our big concern is wildfire, especially in Western Montana. It's what I'm most concerned about. So it's it, it's somewhat generic maybe to the region, but it's pretty specific, you know, it, it was specific to, to, to Montana and Missoula. 
I think we have time for one more question. I see Mark is at the microphone here. So Mark, you wanna go ahead and... Yeah, <clears throat> yes, thank you very much for joining us, Dr. Shilman. Is this on? Yeah, yeah I can hear you. Um, looking, looking back and, and sorry, I, I am old and my parents are too. I grew up here in about the Dust Bowl. Um, if we look back at a hundred years, which is when they started changing agricultural techniques in the Western states to conserve water. There was one of the major sources of the Dust Bowl and then the drought that followed in the 1920s and on to the 30s. So as we look at changes now, what unintended consequences are we looking at? And so in terms of what, what are changes in agriculture, what unintended consequences to those changes may exist? Is that, is it agriculturally specific or? Yeah, I mean, I mean, you know, yes, we, we need to all do our part. And I do believe that we can turn back the whole climate change thing by all putting in. But when we look on major scales of changing um, some of the dynamics, whether it be in agriculture or water conservation, or changing forms of electric power generation. Are we doing studies on the impactfulness of those changes so to, to mediate those unintended consequences? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, this gets at like the, <clears throat> what are the unknown unknowns? And of course, you know, we try to at least get at, you know, what are the known unknowns, right? And <clears throat> um, the, I, I think it's a, it's a really good question. It, you know, what we're dealing with is a, is a complex system. And anytime you have a complex system, you risk um, feedbacks and buffering effects. There's nonlinearities in other words. So things don't always behave the way that you might think that they should behave. And, um, you know, that's one of the reasons why we use these climate models, because they help us understand this complexity in a way that that's pretty hard for, you know, us to, to comprehend. And they help us explore, you know, some of these um, unintended consequences. And I think that, I mean, personally, I find those like some of the most fascinating things to think about in terms of climate climate science and, and then what that means on the ground. So I, I don't know, um, I'd have to think about some of the specifics, but there are a lot and we continue to, to learn those. And I think they're, they're real and there's something that, that need to be considered for sure. Nick, thank you so much. We're, we are um, reached the end of our, our evening time here, but the good news is that Nick is available to come back on Thursday for the first half hour of our class on Thursday and discuss it. And as I mentioned, Nick, by that time, all these folks will have written their response papers. And so they'll have uh, had a chance to think through the many different issues and stuff that you um, brought up here tonight. And so I look forward to that conversation here, but let's, let's thank Nick one more time for a really, really fascinating lecture here. Yeah, thanks. I, I, I look forward, yeah, I look forward to continuing the conversation on Thursday. So thank you all very much for the invitation. Yeah, thank you so much, Nick. And thanks for the uh, focus on the solutions at the end. That's what, it's always so helpful to start thinking about what we can be doing on everything on there. So we will send you, see you on Thursday, uh, Thursday afternoon. I'll all send right. you the Zoom link. Thanks so much. Thank you all. So.